You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and 08 OT. Hello. Wait, wait, did he just announce R08 OT is one of the hosts? Yeah, you remember when he became a host? Oh, oh yeah, that's right. It's either that or pay him. Yeah, okay. Why don't you introduce the story, O8 or T? <laughs> oh. Welcome to the Dunstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 3, page 56. I am one of your human hosts, Rish Outfield. I am the other human host, Big Anklevich, and our final host is O8 O T. Thanks for being here, bud. All right, now go back to editing and answering emails, please. Today's story is A Cat Prince Distinguishes Himself by Abigail Hilton. Hi, I'm Abby Hilton, and I'm a nurse currently working on her master's. I live in Portland, Oregon with two cats, a Roomba, and a GPS named Algernon. Algernon is much more articulate than RO80T, however, he is frequently disappointed with my driving. His favorite phrase is, Recalculating. <laughs> my fiction has been featured in Beyond Centauri and the Drabblecast. One of my stories will appear in the spring 2009 issue of The Greatest Uncommon Denominator. I have a podcast series called The Prophet of Panamandora, available on podiobooks.com, iTunes, and from my website at www.panamandora.com. That's P A N A M I N D O R A H.com. A Cat Prince Distinguishes Himself is part of the backstory of some of the characters in the podcast. This story appears for the first time on the Dune Steve. A Cat Prince Distinguishes Himself by Abigail Hilton The wolfling knew it was going to die. Lexus saw no trace of hope in its haggard face. His attendants had shredded most of the wolfling's clothes in the process of catching it. Lexus paced closer, sniffing, curious. He'd never had an opportunity to see a wolfling this closely before. Now he felt faintly disappointed. Like all shelts, the creature stood on two legs. From the waist down, it resembled its animal counterpart, the wolf. The remains of its bright red doublet and tunic looked even to Lexus's feline eyes, like fine material. The tattered remnants of a gold sash hung from one shoulder. It looked soft and well-fed, and not at all dangerous. Lexus was a young tiger cub. His head came only to the creature's waist, yet he had no doubt he could kill it. His attendants would have made certain it was unarmed. If his keen father found that they'd let his son be injured, they would pay in blood. Lexus wondered whether he would see his father today. He could only remember seeing Dimitri twice, once at a great distance during a procession, and once in his nursery den. His father had watched Lexus learning to hunt rabbits, but he'd never spoken to his cub. And he never will thought Lexus, unless I win my battle in the field of bones. A spear flew over the garden wall and stood quivering in the ground three paces away. In the split second as the spear vibrated between them, Lexus read the tiny flame of hope that blossomed in his victim's eyes. The wolfling lunged for the spear. Before he could lift it, two leopards and a lion were in the air. Stop! bellowed Lexus. The creature is mine! The wolfling had the spear and was backing away. Lexus was impressed. In spite of its court dress and soft body, it had plainly been trained at some point. Lexus took a step nearer. He knew he looked fiercer than he felt. His bone-white fur was stained crimson midway up all four legs, and he was speckled all over with blood. In truth, he hadn't done any of the killing. He'd only been walking through the streets. Your Highness, this is unwise, came the voice of one of the leopards. Your Highness, spat the wolfling. The creator has been merciful. Lexus cocked his head. How so, wolfling? Your city is falling. 
The streets are choked with your dead. Even now my father's cats are overrunning your palace. Soon your king will lie lifeless among his people, and all his line will perish with him. Our cats will hunt down and kill every wolf and wolfling in Sardo de Lore. Where is the mercy in that? The wolfling raised his chin a little. Lexus wondered whether he was of royal blood. Proud, dark eyes flashed. I die today, he said. But Dimitri the Cruel, his son dies with me. He leapt at Lexus, darting out with a spear like a heron at a fish. Lexus sprang to one side, but not fast enough. The spear caught his flank. The wound startled more than hurt him. Lexus had never been physically hurt. One of the lions roared. But Lexus hushed him with a growl, never taking his eyes off the wolfling. They'd moved apart again, the adult cats making a ring around them. The wolfling dodged this way and that, trying to catch Lexus off balance. One son, perhaps, said Lexus. What about the other? He wondered whether his brother would be glad if the wolfling killed him. But then he never would be able to prove himself. Our father would doubt his worth. Lexus and his brother had never seen each other, and never would until they met on the field of bones at two years of age to decide who would rule Philenia. Everyone knew that Dimitri had made the mistake of keeping his last litter together. When it came to the finish, the winning cub had refused to give the killing stroke. Dimitri had killed both of them, and made certain his next litter knew the story. This time, the cubs were reared separately, in the old tradition, this time a strong heir would walk from the field. You can't kill both of us, Lexus told the wolfling. I don't even know where my brother is. Although he's certainly here somewhere. Father wanted both of us here to see his triumph. And perhaps, said a small voice in the back of his head, to prove ourselves. What have I done today except walk through gutters of blood? What have I contributed to this victory? With Dimitri, everything was a test. Lexus wasn't sure he was passing. The wolfling laughed, a ragged, winded sound. <laughs> Lexus wondered how long his guards had played with the creature before bringing it to him. You are the white cub. The other is orange. Everyone knows the white tigers are the worst. There's wizard blood in that line. Some cursed shapeshifter from the time of magic. The first white tiger... Perhaps you will be the last. This time, Lexus darted in under the spear. His training and instincts brought him curving around to the back of the wolfling's leg. The wolfling screamed as the cub's teeth <laughs> severed his hamstring. His blood filled Lexus's mouth for one giddy moment. And then the butt of the spear hit the back of the cub's head so hard that he staggered. Lexus heard a confused hissing sound, a roar, and a snarl. He staggered to his feet and saw one of his guards impaled on the wolfling spear. The leopard was writhing pitifully, screaming. The others would have killed the wolfling already, but a huge gray wolf was standing over the shelt. He must have come from the fighting in the streets, beyond the garden wall. Stippled with blood, one ear missing, and deep scratches over his shoulders. Lexus's first thought was for his guard. This is my fault. But the leopard was clearly beyond saving. He'd opened the wolfling's thigh to the bone, and the shelt was moving weakly in the protective shadow of the wolf. He put his hand out to the animal, who licked it without taking his eyes from the cats. Lexus knew why they weren't attacking. There was no need. The shelt would bleed to death in seconds. The leopard stopped moving, and a terrible stillness descended on the garden. Lexus stared at the wolfling, who should have been his first two-legged kill. The wolf narrowed its yellow eyes, its lips peeling back from white teeth. Lexus knew the wolf couldn't talk. Some said it was the fault of the wolflings, that they'd subjugated and enslaved the wolves. Others said that the wizards had cursed the wolves long ago. Somewhere in that distant past, when the wolves still talked, cats had had their own shelts. Lexus had seen pictures of the creatures with two legs, and tails like cats, and faces and hands of men. But we killed our shelts, he thought, because cats are no one's slaves. He looked at the wolf, 
still straddling the body of the wolfling. Stupid beast. Your master is already gone. That wasn't quite true. The wolfling stirred. Go, he whispered to the wolf. Go, Marin. Live, please. None of you will live, thought Lexus. No inhabitant of this doomed city of my father's triumph. The wolf whined. Lexus saw that she was a female. He could see in her eyes that she had chosen this spot to die. That was all they had left, choosing where to die. He watched her with all his guards tensing around her for the kill. He watched her lower her head again to lick the blood from the wolfling's hand and nuzzle his cheek at the moment of his last shuddering breath. Lexus felt his stomach clench. He knew beyond a doubt that no one would have done as much for him. They would have been appalled if he'd been killed, afraid for their own lives, but not heartbroken. He realized that he was jealous, insanely, gut-wrenchingly jealous. The instant the wolfling was still, the wolf sprang. <laughs> Lexus never gave the order to kill her. His guards probably would have done it even if he'd told them not to. He left the garden feeling miserable and angry. He'd expected to make his first Scheldt kill during this battle. But it was all going wrong. He hadn't done anything except get one of his guards needlessly speared. He wanted to feel that he was in control of those guards. His personal army. Instead, he felt like they were in control of him. He wondered what report they would return to his father. He wondered whether his brother was distinguishing himself while Lexus required babysitting. One of the leopards broke into his thoughts. Is his highness satisfied with the day's work? Lexus glared up at him. No, I'm not satisfied. Not with anything. He would have said it, but that would have been cruel. His guard was not trying to be spiteful, and the dead leopard had been his friend. Lexus wasn't friends with any of them. His guards changed as often as the moons. So that I will never grow attached to them. So that I won't grow weak or stupid or loved. They were in the street again. Lexus tried hard to understand what he was seeing. It didn't look like a battle to him. Not like the neat descriptions and pictures made with lines of stones in the sand. It looked like chaos. It looked like cats going house to house, dragging out wolflings and wolves, and tearing them to pieces. It looked like desperate barricades, easily overrun. It looked like slaughter. I must be strong, thought Lexus. I will be the future king of Felinia, or I will be dead. There is no middle ground. There is no other way. Lexus looked down. He was standing on a metal grill. Underneath, a narrow tunnel connected to the city's drainage and sewer system. It was too small a refuge for adult wolves and wolflings, but directly below him, Lexus saw two small wolfling children. They were obviously in the act of fleeing down the tunnel. One of them, a boy, was staring up at him in abject horror. The boy's worst fears had been realized. He'd been spotted. The other, a girl, was even smaller, and she hadn't seen Lexus. She was leaning against the boy, panting, clutching his hand. Lexus didn't know enough about Scheltz to guess their ages, but he'd supposed they were about his own age. Their clothes looked expensive, now spattered with filth and blood. The boy hadn't moved. He was staring into Lexus's blue eyes. One word, thought Lexus, and my guards will be looking for a way in there. We could flesh out these little wolflings like rabbits. I could fit in that tunnel. I wanted to distinguish myself today, contribute to our victory. That's what I wanted, isn't it? Lexus looked away from the little wolflings. He took a deep breath, yawned, and lay down there in the street. His guards glanced at him, but they didn't say anything. Lexus covered the grill with his body for several minutes. When he stood up, the wolflings were gone. He felt unaccountably light. His improved mood must have shown on his face, because one of the guards asked him cautiously, Is his highness better pleased now? Yes, said Lexus. I think I just saved two members of the royal family. He tried to feel sorry and couldn't. He thought, I hope they run fast and far. I hope they get away. And someday, when we're all grown, when we get to make the choices, 
I hope we change the world. Author's Note Hi, this is Abby. I find short stories more difficult to write than novels. I work on them until I get stuck, and then I go away for a few months or years, come back, work on them some more, go away for a few months or years, (laughs) come back, etc. I think I started fiddling with this story in 2005. It was written as a spinoff to a novel, and not to suit any particular political climate, but its message seems to resonate with people at this point in time. This point in time being early 2009. Cat Prince is a story about hope. It's a story about the next generation looking at each other across the battlefield of their parents' choices, and quietly saying, we're going to do things differently. If you want to find out what happens to these characters later in life, come listen to the Prophet of Panamandora podcast. Thanks for listening, and many thanks to the Dune Steve team. All right, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. What'd you think, Rish? This story, interesting, it's kind of a hobbit to the Panamandora universe. <laughs> Oh, that didn't work at all. But you know how The Hobbit was written first and it introduces you to that world. And here she goes right in her own Lord of the Rings saga that takes place in that world that we all know and love from... What was this story called? Cat Prince Distinguishes Himself. That was the parallel I was trying to make. That was a good parallel. Good job with that. Announcer Man, what do you think of the story? I don't know. Consummate professional. Thanks for coming in, Announcer Man. You're mocking me, aren't you? <laughs> She's got a whole entire novel over on her uh, her podcast that she does. Of Is it a patio book or is that a particular site? But yeah, she's got this whole thing over there that goes along with this stuff that you can go and check out if you would like to, as she mentioned in her uh, introduction. And there will be a link to the site also on the uh, show notes for this episode. But uh, the interesting thing is she's got beyond that one book that's over there she's already preparing a second novel in that series to be podcast a two towers would you say you could say that yeah it's uh called cowrie catchers right i'm sure i don't know i think you might know because uh if i remember right we spoke with abby and she asked us to lend our voices to the production of this upcoming novel so if you don't know you will soon And I believe she's got real podcasters doing some of the other voices. Yeah, there's uh, some people who are worthwhile involved in it as well. So coming up soon, you'll be able to get that. But in fact, she sent us over a promo for her story, The Prophet of Panamandora. 080T, can you play that? Corey showed up at the orphanage two years ago, unable to remember how he'd gotten there. He spoke a language no one recognized, and he was afraid of cars and planes and computers. Corey can remember snippets of another life, but no matter how hard he tries to remember, it just keeps slipping away. Then one day he meets a faunus in an orange grove. She's from a world called Panamandora, and he can understand her language. In addition, Corey can read a language that no one in Panamandora has been able to read for 300 years. Has he really been gone that long? Now he must recover his lost memories and rebuild his life, because the person who tried to kill him once is about to try again. I'm Abigail Hilton, and my novel, The Prophet of Panamandora, is for listeners 13 and older. The book is a free download at patiobooks.com or iTunes. For artwork, maps, and additional information, visit www.panamandora.com. That's P-A-N-A-M-I-N-D-O-R-A-H.com. All right, so there you have it. Check it out, Prophet of Panamandora. Okay, so uh, that was an enjoyable story. We really thank uh, Abby for sending it out to us. And uh, if you have a story that you'd like to uh, perhaps hear on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, what would someone do? Rish, what do you think? Well, I, I think they would wait until the weather gets warmer. When you start to sleep with your windows open, they make a paper airplane out of their story, aim very carefully, From the look you're giving me, that's not the best suggestion. How about they go to the website, www.doonstief.com. They read through the submission guidelines that are on there. Kind of gives somebody an idea of what we're looking for. And then, in the body of an email, they can send us that story to submissions at doonstief.com. 
Is that right? Yeah, that, that, that works just fine. Um, if you have a comment about today's story, if you enjoyed it or whatever you may want to say, uh, hop on to our website at dunesteef.com and leave a, a comment right there in the blog. Or you can also email a comment to editor at dunesteef.com. And you can also check out our uh, pages on Facebook and MySpace. Did you get our Twitter site together yet? But uh, that was Twitter. I don't know. But I've heard it before. They said it on like Starship Sofa or something. They Twitter. And on Escape Pod, they tw- all the cool ones Twitter. Why don't we Twitter? We're just not attractive, man. People would be Twittering with us if... Maybe maybe it's me. I bring you down. I chase the women away. The the Twitterable women, at least. Right. That's too bad. Uh, so, right. And an interesting and important fact to remember is that we pay our authors that send their stories in to us. And the only way we can keep this up is if we receive listener donations. That's really the only way we can keep going. And now it's time to beg for donations. Your turn, right, Rish? You know, this is actually a hard part of our podcast. It's easy to read the story. I mean, unless you're you, apparently. And it's easy to say what the name of the website is. Uh, and it's easy to fight. But, uh, to hey, you know, announcer man has been particularly chatty today. Cheers, guys. Can we have him do it? Sure, announcer man. Take it away. Please, press the button. Nice work, announcer man. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, we all knew that. Okay, so yeah, press the button. We've got a button on our website. It's a PayPal donation button. There's several options. You can donate once. You can donate monthly. You can donate quarterly because we are a quarterly fiction magazine. And uh, yeah, support your local author. I, I really hope they do. Do I want to tell them that we're passing the damn microphone back and forth because the one broke again? Or should I just keep that to myself? No, we could probably keep that to ourselves. Okay, just between you and me, press the button. We're, hey, we're really winding down the winter issue. This is getting pretty close. And then we will be in spring, is that right? Yes, spring follows winter. Let's see, I don't know. I... Your world frightens and confuses me. You know, we had been talking amongst ourselves, amongst. People don't say that enough. They say among, they say between, they say the F word. Well, I say that too. But uh, we've been talking about maybe some kind of special event like we did in October for what month? For April? Yeah, I think April was where we were considering. We haven't figured out what we're going to do yet, though. Okay, but I'll tell the listener, Mr. Smith, next episode we will announce what our April event challenge to our listeners writers oh we got to come up with a catchy name don't we well we'll next time we will a announce what that is and two have a catchy name for it you think we're up to it i hope so yeah right so uh we did an episode last year right before new year's where we talked about our new year's resolutions and you know we mentioned a bunch of worthwhile resolutions and then rish also mentioned uh, a very important resolution to him, which was that coming up this year, we would do a cats versus dogs episode. And we couldn't think of a better story to wrap this episode around than this story, today's story, which is a cats versus dog story. And so tell us why you wanted to do this cats versus dog episode, Rich. All right, folks, take a nap. Back in the summer... Uh, one of those real podcasts that I mentioned before. I don't want to call them our competitors because we can't compete with these podcasts. But a, a podcast that's much, much more well-known, maybe the granddaddy of these kind of things, has a host. And at the beginning of this podcast, back in June, July, August, he uh, just made a statement, an off-the-cuff statement about how the writer of that story of that week had a bunch of cats and he had discovered that creative people have cats. Creative people love cats. Creative people surround themselves with cats. Stupid people, however, non-creative, derivative, empty-minded people are fans of dogs. Little stupid.
stupid, slobbering dogs, just like the people who can't write and can't get published on his podcast. And, you know, that kind of irritated me. It hurt my feelings. It, it offended me. I don't know if it shows. I don't think it does. <laughs> he may be overstating that a little bit. I don't know if that particular host was quite as hit Rish over the head with his opinion as that, but... You do recall what I'm talking about? Where he said, I have found that creative people tend to be cat people. I do remember that. And I, I, I wondered that myself because I consider myself a creative person. Maybe this podcast has demonstrated that I am in fact not. I don't know. Maybe uh, I've given it away, but I have never ever been a cat person. I have always, for my entire life, disliked cats. I have, however, been the owner of two different dogs, and I loved them a great deal. See, I thought that you would be on the cat side and that I was going to be on the dog side. I heard that was the whole reason I was so excited about this episode. Well, uh, I, I own a cat now. Oh, wait. Are you allowed to say that? I think that's against politically correct-ism. I am the shelterer. I'm the humanoid companion of a cat right now. No, I, I can't even say that I'm that. We have a cat that lives in our house. Okay, this was uh, an idea that my wife had because cats tend to be able to care for themselves more. And, and that's really kind of the reason why I dislike them. They don't need people. They don't want people around even. They like the food that people give them. And aside from that, they tend to turn up their nose at people. And I never really liked that about cats. But they take care of themselves. And my wife thought, that'll be a good pet for our kids. Because that way, when the kids don't take care of it, it's fine. It takes care of itself anyways. So we decided to get a cat. I am completely blown away by this. See, I come to your house every single week to do this podcast. And then I end up editing what we have done. And folks, you don't know... How many sniffles and snorts and <laughs> so I have to cut out every single week because I am allergic to cats and Big has a cat. Plus, they've got a bell around the neck of the cat. And if sometimes it runs through the room while we're podcasting, we're like, oh, can you do that part again? So I just assumed that you loved cats so much that you were willing to torture me and make the podcast that much harder to edit. Well, I'm always willing to torture you. Once I heard you were allergic to cats, yeah, I went out and got one right away. But it was actually just you're some... A bad, you're a bad man. You're a very bad man. <laughs> what is that? I don't know. Okay, hey, listener. Maybe we should search it. If you know what that is, that's the second time he's done that. And I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan of cats. And it, I guess cats can tell. You know, my wife also was not a fan of cats. But we got this cat, and it was a little kitten, and it was cute, and it chased after yarn, and it chased after balls, and all of a sudden, my wife is totally in love with this cat. And it was supposed to be one of those cats where you put it outside, and it sleeps in the garage, and it never comes inside the house, and all of a sudden, she's like, I don't think I want it to be an outside cat. I want it to be an inside cat, because then it'll still love me. But yeah, this cat absolutely despises me. It gets up and walks out of the room when I come in. It, you know, all everybody else in the family, they put cat treats in their hands and hold it out, and it will eat right out of their hands. But for me, no, it'll wait until I drop it on the ground. Then it'll touch it. Otherwise, forget it. I, it must know that I am not a cat person. I don't know. So, Doctor, I think my hatred for cats goes back to when I first got my driver's license. And uh, I was driving through town on the way to the farm. And this cat darts in front of the car. The tires go over it. <laughs> and car, I don't think it lurched because it was a cat. And a skeletal structure of a cat is made out of tinker toys, something like that. But, uh, you know, I slammed on the brakes. I'm, I'm, I'm breathing heavy, you know, shaking. Oh, my gosh, I, I killed somebody's cat, somebody's pet. Some child is going to say, Mommy, Mommy, where did Kitty go? And she's going to have to explain the death to the child. And the child's going to grow up as a serial killer because at least that's what happened with me. So I stopped the car. And this was in the middle of the road. Now, granted, we're out in BFE County. And so I can just stop the car in the middle of the road. So I get out and I look behind the car. Uh, you know, expecting to see a cat kebab or whatever you call that. Uh, and and the, but, the, but it's not there. 
And I'm like, oh, no, it's like those movies where it's stuck up under the grill of the car. And you find out when you get home that it wasn't a cat, but your neighbor. So I get down on my hands and my knees and peer under the car. And this cat is looking at me and it goes, Meow! and it jumps out, scares the pee out of me and takes off across the street and into the yard of somebody's house. This cat that I had run over, this cat that I had killed or that I thought I had killed. It, so instead of my concern and my, my, oh, you know, guilt at what I had done, that all became anger. And, you know, I had been startled and, and frightened. And I think that that was the beginning, doctor. Tell me about your mother. Sorry. No, I was getting lost in that story there for a minute. Yeah, I don't I don't know what it is about cats that just turned me off. I know that all of our listeners all love cats, so they're going to be very angry at this podcast. We're off by now, I think. Every author's note, their intro it always says, I live in wherever with 70 cats and a Roomba. <laughs> no, yeah, it seems like everybody has a cat, every author. So maybe that other podcast was right. Maybe all creative people really do love cats. I guess I'm only speaking from the experience of myself where I think I'm creative and I don't like cats. When I was in 10th grade, we had to do a sort of like a point counterpoint debate or something or other. We basically, we had to take two sides of an issue. One of us would make a presentation on that issue. Then the other one would make a presentation on that issue. And so you just picked something that you felt strongly about and signed up for it. There was various things you could choose. And one of them was dogs are better than cats. Cats are better than dogs. So I chose dogs are better than cats. And I made my presentation and I said, you know, cats hate people. Dogs love people. I'm going to digress here for a moment. When my wife said before in that story I was telling, oh, I don't want him to be an outside cat anymore because then he won't love me. Um, what she really wanted was a dog. She wanted a dog. <laughs> she wants an animal that still loves her. And I told her that. I said, hey, if you want this thing to love you, you need to get rid of it and get a dog. So anyways, back to my argument. Yeah, I argued cats don't like people. Dogs love people. Dogs want affection from people. Cats want food from people, and that's all. And, you know, the guy that was arguing the other point gets up there and says, Oh, yeah, we had this dog, and it was a flea-bitten mangy mongrel, and it smelled bad and stuff. And I'm just like, that's because you were a crappy owner. Give the dog a bath once in a while. You lose her. It's like cats are pets for people who can't be bothered to take care of something. Which was the point of you getting it? That's something that your kids could take care of. And then if Super Friends was on and your kids forgot to take care of it, it would be fine. Yeah, that was kind of the point. You know, it's awesome when you were talking about the cats and not liking people and the dogs. Uh, it, George Carlin died recently. And I remember he, in one of his stand-up routines, talked about the difference between cats and dogs. He was saying exactly what you said about a cat does not care if you live or die. And he says, you could have a cat for a pet and you could go away for six months and you come back and you open the door and the cat looks over and goes, oh, you, you're back already. And he's like, but you have a dog as a pet. You go out to the front porch to get the newspaper and you come back in and the dog is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you were gone so long. I, I didn't was going out of my mind without you around. I was like, oh, thank God you're back. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love you so much. And I, I just, I remember him doing that and just like, wow, yeah, he's right. I think there was probably more cursing in the way that he did it. But apparently there have been too much cursing in the last few episodes. Somebody mentioned that. I'm trying to remember who. Uh, that was me. Hey, O.A.T., can you bleep that out? I guess that's my point. Yeah, cats. Was there anything else I was going to say? Was... Well, you can. But see, I was so prepared for you to say, dogs are dirty and flea-bitten and they stink, that I, I had all these points that I was going to make to say, Jane, you ignorant slut. I was going to say, what are cats known as in old wives' tales? And it's like, cats are the companions of witches and the devil. And he's like, and what are dogs known as? Man's best friend. And I was even going to go as far as to say, cats perch themselves on the chests of babies and suck their breath away. And unfortunately, I never got to play that breath away card. I never got to play the Berlin card. It's hard to come by somebody who likes cats unless 
their authors sending stories to us. You know, maybe we've been too negative. Freaking cats. I wish they were all dead. Let's talk about why we like dogs for a minute. And, and for me, it is that the affection and, and, and there is some kind of appreciation on their faces. And, that, you know, I remember that there was this family that had it, the mangy dog that you're debating, pal, talked about that had like ticks in it and stuff. And it was so happy to see me come because when I was a kid, I wanted to be either James Bond or a veterinarian. Boy, I took a wrong turn somewhere, didn't I? Wow. Uh, anyway, so I, uh, there was this dog that they had, and the dog was named Bambi. Uh, yeah, who knew? But it would always have these ticks on it, and I thought it would be cool to remove these ticks from the poor dog. So I would, yeah, take them out, and then a the week later, whenever I would see with the dog again, there would be one or two again. I'd remove them and stomp on them and try not to let the head break off inside the skin. I don't know. Again, very rural upbringing, folks. That's just an elementary school thing, the uh, importance of getting the tick out correctly. All my friends talked about that all the time when I was younger. Did you have chiggers where you grew up? You know, I heard about chiggers on a commercial. I have no idea what the heck they are, and I, you, I don't think you do either. There's a lot of things I don't know. Like what it's like to be truly loved. <laughs> Play the sad music. Oh. You know, it gets hard to uh, express myself in utter sadness every week. Especially after all that love you receive from your wonderful companion, man's best friend, your dog. That's sweet. It, or was that some kind of veiled insult and it wasn't sweet at all? You be the judge of that. I like dogs. I like, yeah, the fact that somebody can talk to a dog. You know, maybe a dog's brain doesn't understand, but they look at you as though what you're saying is important, as though maybe they do understand. And I don't know, my mom has a dog, but the dog is almost too affectionate. It wants, it wants to go with you when you go to the post office, when you go to the whorehouse. When I'm driving, it wants to jump up and be patted and all sorts of stuff. As much as sometimes I do hate it, that hatred goes away as soon as I see that tail wagging and the tongue lolling. I'm going to bring down the room here just a little bit. I'm going to try and find some good in a cat. I've been the owner of a cat now for six months. Our, our cat really likes these little blankets that we have. They're like knit type blankets. Only likes those blankets. I don't know why. Well, that's probably not very cool. Um, let me think. It's a crazy thing that sometimes it'll start running around the room, bounding off of furniture and jumping all over the place. And the cat is kind of cute sometimes. It'll like, when you wake up in the morning, it comes over and it starts rubbing against your leg because, because it wants you to feed it. It's a really soft cat. When you pet it, it feels like you've got like a little stuffed animal or something like that. I don't think I was allergic to cats when I was a kid, but I remember that it would be cool to put your ear up against the cat and hear that noise that they make. Yeah, when we first got our cat and she was a kitten, she used to purr a lot, even when I would pet her. And now she purrs only for my wife, not for anybody else. I'll come home from work and my wife will be sitting there on the couch holding the cat, petting it, and it'll be purring. And then I'll come in and I'll sit down next to her and the purring instantly stops. I don't know if I, I should try and say more about dogs and famous dogs and dogs in literature. I Am Legend by Richard Matheson is one of my favorite stories and I, I just remember being devastated when I get to the part where the dog dies in I Am Legend. Now, you saw the film. Does it happen in the film? He's nodding. Press the button, folks, so we can actually hear what he dies. It, it turns on him, becomes evil. Oh, okay. Well, it wasn't that way in the in the book. It just he hadn't seen another living human, uh, another living anything in like two years, and there was this poor, injured, mangy dog, and he just he did so much to bring this dog back to health, I and mean, because he was a doctor. He had so much emotional investment in this dog and, and that, yeah, it was just all for nothing and the dog dies. And, oh, and it's just like maybe his hope dies too when that happens. And, but, you know, see, there, that's, that's one emotional end of the spectrum is just how moved I was and saddened in that story with the death of the dog. And then, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, I remember one time I was doing an audio book. I was recording and... <laughs> This cat outside my window started making the most ungodly noise. And it was like, Meow! 
it sounded like a woman wailing, dude, I was right outside my window. I was recording at the time, and I jumped out of my skin the same way I did when I was 16, and I thought I'd killed that cat. And holy cow, I mean, thank God that R080T hasn't got a copy of that audio clip to play here at the end of the podcast, because I would just be mortified. They chose that moment, I guess, to just make this terrible, you know, the, the sound that Andy Dick will hear when he descends into hell was this sound that was coming through my window. Oh, geez. You know, our cat that we got, the whole, I mean, the plan all along was to get this cat fixed before it ever made it to going into heat for the first time. But we kept putting it off because we we went to one veterinarian. And they're like, oh, yes, we'll take care of that. It'll only be $500. And we're, you know, we were looking to make an appointment at this other place instead. And in our delay, the cat made it to adulthood and went into heat for the first time. And it started walking around very strangely, <laughs> waddling and doing this weird shaky walk. And, and it kept going, <laughs> making these awful sounds. And Ladies and gentlemen, Carol Channing, once again in the studio. Yeah, my kids are just scared of this cat. And, you know, our appointment to get the cat fixed was like a week after it went into heat. So then it's, it's now taken care of and... I think we won't run into that strange behavior, but cats are known for like, they put that in like cartoons and stuff. The cats all, you know, in the old Tom and Jerry or something like that, the cats all go out, get up onto the fence in the alleyway and go, meow, meow, meow. it's like they're some kind of hellish cat choir. It's funny. Do dogs have awful, I guess they do howl and bark. There are barking dogs that are annoying. And then there's yippy dogs that people can't stand like Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Yeah, there are those dogs that, like, friggin' Paris Hilton carries in her purse. Those are really besmirching the name of dogs. Paris Hilton's dog, Cujo, and the dingoes that ate your baby are, like, the three dogs that have just ruined it for the rest. Yeah, it's basically how it goes. Dog's good, cat's bad. Pretty easy to sum up. All you people who have cats, we still like you. Just not your animals. So to finish off the show, there's this wonderful song. Why don't you tell everybody about this song, Rish? Tell us how you cried. Oh, you don't have to play the sad music. I, I am a very emotional person, as you can tell, with how angry I was, how angry I still am all these months later about hearing that creative people don't have dogs and a book I read a decade ago moving me that much. Mr. Jonathan Colton, who we've talked about on this show many times and will continue to talk about because A, all of his songs are apparently free and B, the guy is immensely talented. He wrote a song that was called Space Doggity. And I remember downloading it and thinking, OK, this is going to be a parody of David Bowie's Space Oddity. And it, it is perhaps an homage to Space Oddity, but it's all about Laika, the, the dog, the Russian dog that went up into space. The first astronaut, right? I know, no, I'm just an announcer. You know, so I, I listened, and I was just devastated by this song. And I went online, and I looked Laika up, and I saw that they shot him up with no, with no expectation that he would come back alive, and that, 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 that he did die. And in the song, Jonathan kind of imagines that, what if he didn't die? Beyond this song, what devastated me <laughs> was I went to Wikipedia and I looked up Laika and there's a, do you want to call it a monument, a memorial? There's a statue of this little dog in Russia. And I just, oh my gosh, man, I became like a five-year-old kid with a skinned knee when I saw this little thing. Maybe I should just shut up and let Jonathan do the talk. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and finish off the show playing Bass Doggity by Jonathan Colton. All right, so that's our show. I'm Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield warning you of a disaster of biblical proportions. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness. Earthquakes. Volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Enough. I get the point. Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. The cage is very small A tiny silver ball Makes you a hero The moment you step inside The world is watching you What you're about to do Will live on forever Even though you'll be dead her head, uncomprehending. Things that tore up, the lady went on, in the land of the living and the world of the dead. I knew something was wrong when Dambala denied his food. Jenna Velvedine. Jesus! Okay, 